welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Gary Whited, a poet, philosopher, and psychotherapist who has a private practice in psychotherapy. Gary works with individuals, couples, and groups, helping them face and move past trauma. He also presents workshops in the US, Europe, and Russia that focus on the practice of deep listening as a vehicle for healing family issues, grief, and shame. In both his work and his writing, Gary listens fiercely for what needs to be said, and he allows a sense of discovery to guide him. At times, he incorporates poetry into his workshops and his work with clients. Before becoming a psychotherapist, Gary taught philosophy at several colleges and universities throughout the U.S., most recently at Emerson College in Boston. His coursework covered both Western and Eastern philosophies with an emphasis on ancient Greek philosophers. Gary grew up on the plains of Eastern Montana, and a strong sense of place pervades his poems whether that place is the prairie, the city, or the inner spaces we inhabit. His poems have appeared in several journals, including Salamander, Plain Songs, Atlanta Review, and Comstock Review. His book, titled Having Listened, was selected as the winner of the 2013 Homebound Publications Poetry Contest. It has recently received a Benjamin Franklin Book Award and one of the poems from the book has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Gary is here to talk about listening and inner spaces. I'm delighted to have him on the set. Mm. Gary, welcome. Thank you. Thank Took you a while for, mm. for us to get together because of all of the snow, yeah. but you were here. Yes. And I you have am. a poem for us. I do, I do. This poem uh, responds to your introduction about listening, and this is a poem from my early years on the prairie, and though I didn't probably think it at the time, I was beginning to learn to listen. Mm. So this poem harkens back to one of those early times. It's called Nighthawk's Path. It happened the first time on the dirt cow path when I walked behind the milk cow, evening shore time light gliding across Shadbull Creek, now shadowed for the night. When I stood still, that hum no one ever talked about coming from the earth moved up my legs into my hips, turning this body into sound. Light flared yellow, gathered around haystacks fence posts, the cow, and me. Mm. Ah, I love that idea of listening for the hum. Yeah. Mm. I didn't know it for years, and then on a trip back to visit, after I had lived elsewhere, I was out in a pasture by myself, and I was standing. Mm. I'd been riding horseback, and I got off the horse, and I was just standing there, and I realized there's a hum coming mm. up my legs from down there. Mm -hmm. So this poem harkens back to that for me, and yeah, there's so much that the the prairie was offering in the mm -hmm. way of listening that I didn't know at the time. I just was growing up on the prairie. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and you and I have had conversations about the fact that in life there often is so much that is able to speak to us mm. or trying to speak to us. Mm. And you have talked about exiles and protectors, which mm. I thought was a fascinating way mm. to look at the various parts of who we are. Mm -hmm. So would you tell us a little bit about exiles and protectors mm. and what they do? Mm. Yeah, I'd be happy to. It's a nice question. It, it, uh, it leads into my work as a psychotherapist, which is in some way for me a continuation of listening that mm -hmm. I began to do on the prairie. And there's a model of psychotherapy, a, a psychotherapy model that has this notion of protectors and exiles. Uh, it's referred to as the internal family systems model. Mm. 
Exiles are usually those parts of us, not always, but often the young parts of us that carry burdens from wounds that happened early in our lives. And they carry the burden of the feelings, the negative beliefs, the unwanted thoughts, as well as feelings that the rest of our internal system don't like us to have to feel or mm. to think. Mm -hmm. And that's the job of the protectors who um, try to keep the exiles exiled, keep them out of range of our listening and our feeling life, mm. and keep them out of the mix of our current life, um, like negative beliefs that I'm not good enough, or mm -hmm. I don't look good enough, or I something, any not good enough kind of message. It's often an exile that's erupting. And when you're in an encounter in your adult life, it's, it's not a happy moment to have one of those exiles come up. So the protectors work to keep them pushed away. The problem with exiles, <laughs> the problem with exiles is that the very thing they're protecting against, they often bring about. It's paradoxical. So learning how to listen to the protectors and the exiles, to listen for what their concerns are, is the way to help them relax and stop working so hard to protect against the exile. Because mm -hmm. if, uh, just to use myself as an example, um, I'm an exile that carries this, or has carried this belief for most of my life that somehow I'm unwanted. Mm. And so, uh, you know, it's just from all the messages I received growing up and, and, um, and some of the things that happened back there. So I have protector parts who are always giving me signals that in some way or another, I might not be doing something good enough. Because mm -hmm. that, if I, if I fail to do something good enough, that could be a good reason to get unwanted. Mm -hmm. And so those protectors that keep giving me those, message, those messages, they, they somehow throw me off, get me into a kind of a constrained place where in fact I behave in ways that do make people react. Mm -hmm. And then I feel unwanted. So mm -hmm. the protector, trying to protect against that very upsurge of feeling of unwantedness, can create situations or at least, you know, inform situations where that sort of thing, exactly that happens. Now I can hear many people who would say, well, I, I can relate to that. I have those same feelings and concerns, but why should I listen to the protectors or the exiles? Mm -hmm. Aren't they getting me into trouble? Aren't they just saying, mm -hmm. you're not good enough? Yeah. So from your perspective as a psychotherapist, how do you learn to listen to them in mm -hmm. a way that's mm -hmm. healthy? Yeah. Well, the there are like two really good questions in what you said. And the first question I hear is, you know, why listen to them? Why not just mm -hmm. keep them mm -hmm. away? Uh, the first answer that I would give is that if we listen to them, the, the burdens they carry get lifted off their shoulders. And there's something that we, goes by the simple name of healing that can happen. Mm -hmm. And once the exiles that are carrying unwanted feelings and the protectors who are guarding against those erupting into consciousness are uh, listened to, they seem to be able to relax. Mm -hmm. And the whole system opens up and you feel a sense of spaciousness. Mm -hmm. And the listening, another word that I use for the kind of listening I'm speaking of here in the psychotherapy process is the word witnessing. Mm -hmm. When our mm -hmm. parts that are carrying the worst wounds, the most negative beliefs about us are witnessed, they relax. Mm -hmm. They seem to really love that energy of mm -hmm. witnessing, where they're not being made wrong, they're not being pushed away, they're mm -hmm. just being listened to. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually there's a poem that speaks to this. I could read if you'd like. Okay. It's called uh, um, In This Body. I just have to find it here, one second. Yeah, Th this is a poem, I, I, I wrote this poem long before I knew the term exile. Mm -hmm. And I realized after I learned this therapy model, this is an exile poem. 
called In This Body, and it's one of those poems where the title is the first line of the poem. So it goes like this. In this body, there are rooms that close their doors. Years pass, and a breeze moves through. Maybe it was the look of that man with red hair and heavy hands, or the woman crossing the street with the soft fingers and faraway stare. A door blows open slightly. The hinges barely agree. Behind that door, there's a small child who wants you to call him by name. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a poem that honors the presence of exiles. And what they really want is to be called mm -hmm. by name and called mm -hmm. out and invited mm -hmm. into the space of our listening. Mm -hmm. Poets often speak of listening, and they talk about being witnesses and how important their work is. The kind of listening and witnessing that a writer does, mm -hmm. is it very much different than the kind of work you do mm -hmm. with patients? Mm -hmm. Nice question again. And uh, I think not. I think it's basically the same. I think everything wants to be listened to. Mm. And I think we humans, as the kind of mammal creatures we are, we're organized to listen. Mm. We're organized to listen. We probably do it in utero before we're born. Mm. We're listening to everything around us, mm -hmm. probably, in some fashion. And so the, the, the process of psychotherapy and the process or experience of writing a poem, at least for me, uh, is a process of listening. Mm. If I think that I'm going to go write a poem, you know, I can try and something might come and I can work at it. But if I listen to something, um, like the way the light lands on the wall next door in the late evening, or the way the icicle drips down in the middle of the winter, and something speaks to me there, and I start writing there, I might find a poem through the listening. Mm -hmm. Just like with a client in psychotherapy, uh, people come who are struggling with things, and when they start speaking, when I listen, the story wants to come out. The mm. story wants the listening, the listening wants the story. So it mm -hmm. becomes a co-created kind of listening engagement where anything can happen. And mm -hmm. what often happens is that witnessing that's really healing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. It changes our, so r writing a poem in response to something that really grabs our attention changes our relationship to whatever that is. Mm -hmm. When somebody comes to a therapy process and tells their story, their relationship with what that story represents from their life begins to change. And mm -hmm. once that happens, that's where healing can occur. Mm -hmm. when, not, you know. mm -hmm. when you are writing a poem, is it that same process for you, or is it more a process of discovery, or maybe a little bit of both? It is a process of discovery. It's a process of waiting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I have a good friend who's a midwife, and she says, I wait for a living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, writing a poem and practicing psychotherapy feels like that kind of waiting mm -hmm. for what wants to birth itself into mm -hmm. your consciousness, mm -hmm. into your listening. So writing the poem has that feel like it's waiting for something to emerge, mm -hmm. to show itself, and to offer itself. Mm -hmm. When you begin to write a poem, does that process usually start because of an image, or a sound, or an idea? Mm, mm. Really good question. I would say all of the above, mm. but other things too. It can, uh, the urge for a poem can come from like listening to a song and noticing something in my body feels responsive mm -hmm. to that song. Mm -hmm. Like a way it makes me want to move or something it reminds me of, wh where the memory is like stored down here in my belly and, mm -hmm. and something starts to mm -hmm. emerge. Mm -hmm. And 
words will start to then form in response to that experience. And that might be where a poem begins. Mm -hmm. And if I keep listening there, often to something in my body, like a feeling or a sensation or just that urge to move, I c a poem can come. Mm. I do the same thing in, in the psychotherapy practice where someone's telling their story and something hits me and, and I'm touched by it. If mm -hmm. I listen to that, I don't always say this is happening to me, but inside I listen to it and it guides me as to what is ready to come forth in this person's telling of their story. So mm -hmm. it's really not different in that way. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question, I guess, is it can be just about anything. Mm -hmm. The way the light hits the plant when you glance over by the window where it's mm -hmm. sitting, and suddenly you're back someplace where you, some part of you, someplace in you, a memory occurs, mm -hmm. and, and then a, a poem might come. Mm -hmm. Our society is so fast-paced. Often people don't want to slow down. Mm. They don't want to listen. And sometimes people just don't hear because they are moving so rapidly. Yeah. How do you help someone learn to listen? Uh, wow. It's beautiful. So the first thing I want to say is, I. I listen for where I can sense or hear that their listening is blocked. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like some urgency they have, like they feel anxious and they want to get rid of the anxiety. As soon as they start talking about wanting to get rid of the anxiety, I know that's the first place to listen because the urge to get rid of the anxiety blocks their listening to the anxiety. Mm. Because mm -hmm. the anxiety really is information. It wants to tell them something. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Sometimes anxiety is obvious. It's telling you to get out of the way of the mm -hmm. car coming down the street. Or <clears throat> make sure your child doesn't fall off the steps that they're walking too near. But oftentimes in the psychotherapy process, anxiety is telling us that our conscious awareness, our memory, is getting near something that makes the psyche really get worried mm -hmm. that that, whatever that might be, could happen again. And so I, I listen for the places where I hear the person's listening blocked. I listen to that and then I invite them to listen, to borrow my listening mm -hmm. and I kind of mirror back what that concern is that blocks their listening. And once that happens, then the door opens for listening to the anxiety or the depression mm -hmm. or the grief mm -hmm. or the shame, whatever it mm -hmm. might be, that once listened to becomes the guide to what's ready to be spoken, to come into the light, so to speak, come into mm -hmm. the words that yeah. are spoken and mm -hmm. released. Yeah. Mm. What happens when someone does listen to the protectors and the exiles and moves past the shame and the grief? Mm. Then what happens? Mm. That, um, the, the, the answer that comes, the first answer that comes, I, I love the, your questions, <laughs> is anything can happen there. But mm. the first thing that happens is those protectors relax. Hmm. When they start to feel the presence of listening, they relax. They really relax back. And, and then the exiles can come forward and be witnessed. And once that happens, they relax. And then, again, to, to use the word I used a little bit ago, there is a kind of spaciousness that begins to open. And in that spaciousness, hmm. then you can actually begin to inquire of the person if you weren't so busy tending to this anxiety or this fear, this shame or this grief, what would you really like to be doing here? Mm -hmm. What would you really like to have happen mm -hmm. if you didn't have to spend so much of your energy tending to this shame mm -hmm. or grief or that problem over there? What if that was actually resolved and you could just be here and mm -hmm. be yourself? Mm not mm -hmm. be the one who's busy trying to manage things away and protect against things, but just be yourself. That's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that can happen. It's a little bit general, but, but it, it would be hard to say more. But the, the, the 
event or the experience of feeling like I could be myself is something I hear often in the psychotherapy process. Mm -hmm. Like people work through some deep shame or grief and, and they start talking about things that really excite them. That's mm -hmm. the sort of thing that can mm. happen. So it sounds as though not only can people be themselves, but they can become more than what they may have thought possible, yeah. more of what they expected. Yeah. They can, in many ways, yeah. transform. Yeah. Yes. And one of the wonderful things about practicing psychotherapy is I, I'm given the honor and the privilege of watching that happen, mm -hmm. like seeing it happen in somebody's body or their face or hear it in their voice or see it in their eyes where they actually transform right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And it's really beautiful. It's mm -hmm. always a gift. It always feels like a gift. And then it becomes a you know, co-created gift back and mm -hmm. forth. And that's... Mm -hmm. That's quite wonderful. Hmm. Now, when you were writing poetry, and there is also that back and forth, mm -hmm. does it feel like a co-created gift? Mm -hmm. And if yes. so, yeah. how would you describe that gift? Does it change you in your story? Oh, yeah. Every time. Every time a poem comes, I feel changed mm -hmm. in some way. I feel like some space opened up in me that let that poem come through. Mm -hmm. I don't ever feel like I made the poem. Mm. I feel like every poem is a co-creation from mm. something that occurred to me and then the way it lands in my memory space and my way of making mm. sense of things mm -hmm. and off I go. Mm. Hmm. Are people born knowing how to listen? Uh, I would say we're born wired to listen. Mm -hmm. And then all kinds of things can happen right away that constrain mm -hmm. that capacity to listen. Mm -hmm. Lots of things can constrain it. Mm -hmm. And lots of things can support it and mm -hmm. open it up. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, yes, we are born to listen. We have that wiring in our systems. Mm -hmm. and. Again, depending on what happens once we're here, mm. with whomever we're here and wherever we are, for me, like the prairie, was that which invited my listening into it, mm -hmm. much more than the people I grew up with. Mm. They were not mm -hmm. interested in hearing mm -hmm. much from me, but mm. the prairie, mm -hmm. yeah. There is such a strong sense of place mm. in your work. Mm. Does having connection to a place, does it ground you or does it help you move forward? I would or say both? both, yeah, yeah. I think it, it's both a grounding and, it, you know, f having that grounding is probably the condition for the possibility of moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your work explores not only the external places but the inner places yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. are the inner places richer because of dealing with some of the past issues or traumas? Oh, yeah. I would say it is. I, I, I think that not dealing with the past traumas mm -hmm. or shames or griefs mm -hmm. is what constituted the constraint that I felt mm -hmm. like I lived in for years. Working on that stuff has opened things up uh, in, in all kinds of ways, and writing poems mm -hmm. has opened mm -hmm. things up. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. What has poetry's best gift to you been? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What a question. Well, two things I would say right off. It, it has definitely deepened my listening, mm -hmm. and it has invited me to feel confident hmm. in how I listen and how I hear things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That's wonderful. I think that's probably the most important thing I could say is the gift of poetry, writing it, reading it, responding to it, hearing other people read their poems, and out of that getting a sense of my own listening. Mm -hmm. It's not just my own voice, it's my own listening. Uh -huh. mm. You made a comment during one of our conversations 
And I love this statement. Poetry is so deep in the human psyche, none of us do not have access to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you think about you know, the, the ancients, you know, back to the ancient Greeks, for example, and the Iliad and the Odyssey, they were spoken. Mm -hmm. they, were spo mm -hmm. they were recited over and over. Mm -hmm. And every culture has that kind of early experience in it of, of the oral tradition, mm -hmm. where we, it's, it's in the human DNA mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to speak and be heard. Yeah, there's a saying among the, uh, the ancient Mayans that uh, the reason we are storytelling creatures is because we're grieving creatures. Mm. And that's how, in the Mayan tradition, the process of grieving happened is by telling mm. the story. The grief is always in the details. Telling the stories with all their details is the way the grieving happens. So again, it's that oral tradition that is mm -hmm. like embedded in us mm -hmm. and blocked a lot. It's mm -hmm. f amazing that with all the communication systems we have in place mm -hmm. now, how little listening there is. Mm. That's true, very yeah. true. We are almost out of time. Uh -huh. Would you read another poem for I us? I would love to, yeah. So I'll, I'll read a poem. Uh, it's, it's uh, called My Blue Shirt, and, and uh, this poem is, it comes from listening to this shirt that just happened to be there one day. And again, it's a poem where the title is the first line of the poem, so it's called My Blue Shirt. My blue shirt hangs in the closet of this small room, collar open, sleeves empty, tail wrinkled. Nothing fills the shirt but air and my faint scent. Mm. It waits, all seven buttons undone, buttonholes slack, the soft fabric with its square white pattern, all of it waiting for a body. It mm. would take any body, though it knows in its shirt way of knowing only mine has my shape in its wrinkles, my bend in the elbows. Outside this room, birds hunt for food. Young leaves drink in morning sunlight. People pass on their way to breakfast. Yet here, in this closet, the blue shirt needs nothing, expects nothing, knows only its shirt knowledge that I am now learning how to be private and patient, how to be unbuttoned, how to carry the scent of what has worn me, and to mm. know myself by the wrinkles. Mm. Thank you for helping mm. us know ourselves. Mm. You are welcome, and thank you for inviting me to this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much.
What about my privacy? It's protected. And the music I listen to? Protected. What about how I wear my hair? And the things I say and write? The Constitution protects your rights. It isn't an old, fading piece of paper. It's a living document. The Constitution says there are three branches of government. So we're kind of like the fourth branch of government. We are the future of America. Find out how you can become part of Constitution Day. For me. For all. For real. Go to aclu.org slash constitutionday.